Hello everyone, this is Jasmina, and in this video I'm going to talk about how to deal with feng shui in open uh, floor plans. Now, of course, feng shui was developed when rooms were relatively small and only emperors could really afford large open buildings. Of course, those buildings, even for emperors, were not for living. They were for doing official work. And actually, large open spaces, in some ways, is really good for feng shui because you don't have to worry about walls and doors stopping the flow of qi. So a studio apartment is actually good because every single area in the, in the space receives qi, simply because there's no walls. Now today, of course, newer houses often combine the kitchen, the dining room, and some sort of living space Sometimes it's a family room, sometimes it's just the living room, family room, one, one general room. And there are no defined or distinct changes between the two places or the three places. And the kitchen usually is pretty clear, but the other two, they kind of blend together. Now, there, sometimes there's a difference in ceiling height or, or even in the style of the ceiling. And this does create a natural division without a wall, but that, that may not happen either. Differences in flooring can do this too, but it's really not that common. Uh, I mean, it used to be that your dining room would have the, a similar type of flooring, an easy to clean flooring, not like carpeting, uh, in your dining area, because if you have kids, there's going to be lots of messes. But the rugs today, this, the carpet today, is actually much easier to clean, so that might not even happen nowadays. Now, what this means is that you need to decide what space is what, and you demarcate the spaces by usage and often also furniture placement, because that defines what you use the space for. Now, although these open floor plants lack walls, Still, most people do organize the spaces where particular activities take place. Now, if you only eat in, in your living room watching TV, well, that's, then you don't really have a dining room. Uh, the, you know, it's, it doesn't make, uh, I mean, you probably have one. Maybe you have it for special occasions. But that is mixing two things and and it's sometimes it's not a problem, but sometimes it can make it a little murky. So what you need to do is you need to define your spaces in real life, basically measure them, and then transfer that to your floor plan. And 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 of course you'll you it's a smart idea to mark it, but most people can remember what's going on. And again, yes, you do measure. You actually measure the spaces in real life and you transfer that to the floor plan. So you have to understand how to use scale or at least how to get it in the right space in the floor plan. Again, furniture placement can help define these areas. That's the most common way. Usage can also separate spaces or it can blend spaces. For example, always eating in front in the living room watching TV that blends the two. And again, sometimes ceiling height or other structural members like a beam, that can also define a room. And, uh, and since it's not really good to be sitting or being placed underneath a beam for long periods of time, that does, this is why it helps really separate it into two different rooms, because it's quite uncomfortable um, it, it, to have a beam over you. Um, most people have a sense that you'd rather be aware the ceiling's higher. I mean, this is normal uh, human behavior. Now, many rooms span two adjacent sectors. This can even be true of small rooms. It all just depends on how your house is laid out and what direction it faces. And this can happen in any room. It can happen in kitchens, bedrooms, living rooms, dining rooms, bathrooms. Of course, many of these places we don't care about, like bathrooms, laundry rooms, storerooms, we don't really care. But 
Again, any one of these places can have a room that is split between two adjacent sectors. That doesn't mean you can't use feng shui. There is a way to, that there's standard ways that we treat this. Basically, for most rooms, other than the three important types of rooms, the sector that has the larger area determines which sector the entire room occupies. And this would be true for living rooms, dining rooms, um, uh, laundry, bathrooms, places that really aren't important. The kitchen, the kitchen has special rules. It is the sector where the range or cooktop is located. That will determine what sector the kitchen is in, even if that sector is less than half of the kitchen area. That is a hard and fast rule. Bedrooms, it will be the sector where the headboard is located. Now, this means you may be able to decide, depending on the room layout and the size of your bed, you may be able to decide where, which sector your, your bedroom has because you can move your bed. For home offices, it's the sector where the, the chair to the desk, the main desk is located. And, uh, and it's really, it's where you are sitting, not necessarily your desk, but where you're sitting. So if it is a small room, this could be kind of tricky because that, that chair could put you in a different sector than you think you're in based on your desk. So these three are the important types of rooms in your house. These are the ones you pay the most attention to. Now, when we talk about bedrooms, if it's only a guest room and only used for a guest room, you can ignore that as a bedroom, uh, at least for your usage. Somebody else may use it for a bedroom and then they really care you know, what, what's happening. But these are the rooms that you pay the most attention to. Now, even though any given room will be considered only to have the properties of one sector, you know, de depending on which one of these rules apply, when you're placing an activation, for example, for a date selection, you, or you want to activate a certain star, you need to place it in the right, the correct subsector or sector, depending on what exactly what you're doing, based on the pie chart, not based on what the room's uh, identification is. It really, you need to be in the right sector. And so this is why you need to have a really good floor plan and, a really, and, and be able to place the compass properly so you know exactly where these sectors and subsectors are. So if you are going to be placing an element to activate, it's actually a lot easier usually to place it near the outside walls and it gives you more room to properly place it so you don't accidentally get it in the wrong place. And, and it will be clear as we go on why I say this. Now, it, when, when we talk about activation, it, the best activity to activate is actually some sort of activity that's related to your goals. So if your goal is to get fit, that means exercising in whatever is the good space, uh, the space you want to activate. Of course, you've got to make sure that there's nothing going wrong with that space, but that is a different, um, a different thing to consider. Uh, if it has to do with finances or job related, anything to do with money, then this would be the place where you'd want to learn new skills because this will help you earn more money. Now, the second best type of activity, if for some reason you cannot do that activity there, maybe it's somebody else's bedroom or something like this, the second best thing is movement. Uh, and that could be pacing in there, uh, rearranging the larger furniture, which usually takes two people. Uh, you could do a thorough cleaning. You could nail a picture hanger on the wall and hang something up so you don't have to look at the picture hanger. Uh, so any one of these things will activate it. And 
Um, and so you wouldn't have to be in there doing the activity. But this is a, a good, I mean, this is a physical thing, and this is why it's, it's a good activator. Now, the last choice really is elemental activation, although a lot of people want to do it because it is easy. But really, I would try to do an activity that's related to your goals first. But it does require you, if you're going to do an elemental activation, it requires you to understand which stars are timely in your particular house and what is the suitable element to use to activate that given star or stars that are in that location. Now, you, you actually look at the star you want to activate if you're talking about activating a star and not a date selection thing. Uh, so if it has to do with money, you're looking at the facing star in the flying star chart. If it has to do with health or relationships, you're looking at the sitting star in the flying star chart. So you have to know what you're trying to activate too. So this is a bit more complicated. There are two types of, of activations that are usually used, and they're recognized to be the strongest and most effective, and that is fire and water. Um, of course, activity is still better. Even this type of activity is better than using fire or water. It's just more work, which is why so many people would prefer to use an element. Now, moving metal can be used it's not as effective as fire or water, but for some stars it's safer. But it, but there are, but most of the time you can use one of these, depending on the situation. So I'm going to give you a table. It'll have the stars one through nine, the best act activation for an element. Will be here, and I'm then. I'm this really is only relevant for period nine. If we reach period one, this chart would change. So basically, I'm answering is this star timely in period nine? And then, if you do activate it, what happens? So we start with star one. Star one is a water star, so it's activated with water. It is timely in period one, and this is true of any chart. So that includes the annual charts uh, and the month and the day, you know, the time charts. And this basically, when you activate it, you can get help from others. You will find someone, it doesn't have to be someone older, it could be somebody young, younger, but somebody is going to give you some help that you need to move forward with your life or your career or whatever your issue is. So this is a very good star. Star two is a little bit tricky. It is an earth star and uh, fire produces earth, so you use fire. Now, every master, everybody I've, I've read about says that in the flying star chart, star two is timely. There's a big disagreement about star two as an annual star. And, and it would also assume that applies to month and day star two. Uh, but, and I actually have a video that discusses this in more detail. Right now, it's at least this year, 2024, actually all the way through 2028, we're not really going to be able to activate star two without activating an annual affliction. So we won't really know until 2029 and usually at least in the last half of the year because this is, um, this is unknown at this moment for, let's say for certain. I'm with the people that say star two is timely because even the strictest interpretation says it's timely and it should be timely everywhere. But we do have to wait and see. Now, if it's a flying star and it's in the facing star, that would mean increased wealth. That everybody agrees upon. So it is a big shift and it's going to take some people some time to get this, but this really applies with a facing star in your flying star chart. And every place else, the interpretation is a bit more cloudy. So star three, this is a wood star. So water produces wood, so we use water to activate it. It is not timely. So as an annual star, this is not good. 
and in your flying star chart, unless you have a special formation, it is also not good. Uh, and this is known to be an argument star, uh, but if, uh, if it's timely, it basically means growth, um, you know, improvement in your life in some ways. Uh, this was a little hard to find out what happens when it's timely because it hasn't been timely in a long, long time. And uh, some, one, one group says it's fame, another one says it's wealth, but what star three it represents is a tree. So um, it's basically growth, improvement of some sort. So star four uh, is in the strictest sense, not timely, but everybody agrees that it tends to give its positive things. So it's acting timely, even though maybe technically it is not. And again, it is also a wood star, so it uses water for activation. And uh, basically what you get when you activate that is improved learning. You learn faster and more deeply. You know, you understand better. So this is a very, very important star in your house. And this is one that you would look for this in your flying, or in your facing star of your flying star chart. So star five is a pretty negative star. Uh, if you do have a special formation, theoretically this is positive, but since every other star is also positive, I would still not use this unless I had to. Uh, of course, as a base star, it's not a big deal, but as a facing or a sitting star, it, it's, let's say, has more activity. Now, five is Earth star, so it uses fire. As an annual star, this is what determines where five yellow is located. So it's quite negative uh, as an annual star. And as a monthly and daily star, too, it's not very good. And it could be misfortune of any type. Now, if it's timely, it can increase wealth. But this would only happen in your flying star chart. Uh, so, um, and that would have to be a, uh, an activated special formation in your flying star chart. Then you can say that five could give you wealth. Now, star six is um, good. Uh, it's actually a pretty good star. It's it's like star four. It's generally good, even when it's not necessarily great uh, or technically timely, but it is a metal star. And this is why I recommend moving metal. Now, there are times when you could use fire and it's particularly good if spending is a problem because fire being fire uh, controls metal. So that helps tamp down and, and keep the metal from going a little crazy. Uh, because six is related to finances, income, wealth, all these kind of things. So it is something that you could use. Now star seven uh, it generally is not timely. Um, it's not timely as an annual star you would have to have a special formation in your flying star chart for this to become timely. And again, that's why I just recommend moving metal because water will weaken star seven. Um, then, uh, but if it happens to be timely, I still recommend moving metal rather than anything else. Uh, largely because it, it's, it's not the, it's just not a very timely star. Even when it's timely, you know, it, it's, it scares a lot of people. And uh, so moving metal again is the safest. Now, star seven is often, often called the robbery star. And that's really true of the annual star. But if, it, if it's timely, it actually improves communication. Now robbery doesn't necessarily really mean robbery. It could mean you lose something important. You just misplace it. It's not gone. It's just you can't find it. So uh, this is this is why this is not a, a very good star. But again, if you have a special an activated special formation in your flying star chart, and this is it could either be in the facing or sitting. The the sitting would be more for your family. The facing more for your your job. So it could still improve communications. 
Um, if you were to do anything, uh, uh, I still say moving metal is the best. Fire may be okay. That would be the only other one. And maybe that would be good if you were exaggerating too much. So, you know, then fire it would probably be a little bit better. But in general, you're not going to be activating seven unless you have an activated special formation in your flying star chart. Now, eight, most people love eight. And in period eight, it was the well star. It is no longer a well star because we are not in period eight anymore. It is an earth star, so it has fire. It is still generally considered timely, even though it is the weakest possible it can be in period nine, but uh, it's still generally good. And, and it's not a sector that you should avoid. Now star nine, this is this period star. So it's the wealth star for period nine. It is a fire star, so it uses fire. And of course it's timely. And it also brings general good luck. So again, if you have an activated special formation in your flying star chart, then everything is positive. If you have a special formation in your purple white chart for one year, you'll have it in all years because of the way it works. I have a video that can help you find out whether or not you have this. Uh, and, uh, but this, the, the purple white chart is changes every year. So it is activated by time. So you don't have to worry about landforms. Now, those two charts can have all of these things be timely. However, as an annual star, you obey this. We know for certain seven, five, and three are untimely as an annual star, also as a monthly or daily star. There is still this question about star two. What is it like as an annual star? And again, we may not know for a while. So annual stars in general always obey timeliness. And in 2029, finally star two is in a sector that can be activated and is not with an annual affliction. So unfortunately, that's still five years away and we won't know, we won't be able to prove it one way or the other, um, what star two is like as an annual star until then. So in the meantime, we use caution, largely because it's with an annual affliction. So you don't wanna activate it anyway. You also need to be aware of where the annual afflictions are, of course, and uh, you have the Grand Duke, the three uh, animal subsectors of the three killings, and uh, the five yellow. Now the five yellow is a 45 degree sector, so that's quite um, big. Now the uh, year breaker is uh, also important, especially if you clash with the year animal. So this year, 2024, if you have a dog in your chart, you're gonna clash somewhere. The year is probably the most important, uh, but the month and uh, if you're a working adult is also important. Now it doesn't actually, it doesn't mean things are totally negative. In fact, I actually like year breaker years for myself. I tend to actually make breakthroughs, um, but that's because I just work very hard uh, and it usually doesn't happen that year, but the problem crops up and then I solve it and it, it, it turns out to be a really good thing. So you've got to know how to look at year breakers. Now you do not activate an area with an annual affliction, even if it has a timely star that you want to activate or a date selection or heavenly uh, assistant, our subsector, these are usually some, some date selections have subsectors, others don't, but the heavenly assistant hour always does. You can manifest there. You just don't want to activate it, um, it unless you can activate it very quietly. Like you're just working on the computer. You're not taking phone calls. You don't have music playing. That could work, but really it's safest just to manifest here. And if you want to activate with an, and that's not a bad idea to activate, but then you would uh, activate with some relevant activity in your house's best subsector. 
And I do have a video that will help you find that. I can't just tell you what it is without knowing all your charts. So this is work that you have to do or you hire someone to do it. Now, you don't also want to activate a subsector that you or your family members clash with. So you look at the animal sign for everybody. Now, some of the date selection uh, is uh, associated with an animal sign subsector. Some of it is associated with an element subsector. So that's not too bad, but the animal sign you can clash with. Uh, now the timely star will be a 45 degree sector. So the animal sign will be there. So you wouldn't want to activate those areas. And the year is important for everybody. Um, the month is important for the working adults. However, the day can be important if your issue or what you're trying to activate and solve is related to your spouse or your significant other. And if it's investment of children or even idea related, like you're trying to come up with new ideas, then you don't want to clash with the hour either. So, uh, so this, you really have to look at a lot of stuff. And this is why people get paid to do this because there's a lot of stuff to look at. So of course, the best way to learn is by example. So I'm going to show you some examples here. This is just the general floor plan. I just threw together very quickly. You can ignore everything over here. We're just going to really be looking at this open floor plan part. So you again need to define your spaces. That's how we start. So the kitchen, it's usually the cabinets that will define your spaces and, and to some extent your appliances, depending on the situation. So uh, I just took this wall and just said, okay, there, this is the kitchen. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be close. So the dining room, maybe I could bring this in a little, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, I just brought that straight across and this becomes the dining room. That's pretty simple. And you want to leave enough space. You don't want to just enclose your table and the chairs. You, you also, have perhaps other things in there. Uh, and also you have to have room to move around. So it's usually not just the furniture. It is the general area. Now the main door generally, um, I do give it a certain space and it's basically twice as wide as the door and twice as, uh, twice as deep. Um, but so you can see if we were to do a double door and there's a little extra room, but uh, you would have this basic space. And so this gives you enough room to be around the door. When people come in, you know, you open the door, they come in. If you're in a, in an Asian household, you probably take your shoes off. So there's usually a bench sitting here. So this is the area where all that happens. And then the living room, the living room is probably the most fluid in terms of boundary because it will largely depend on how you lay out the furniture. Now, if this happens to be a garage, and I kind of assume that there's one here, the door will either be here or here, just because this is the way they, they set out rooms. Um, they almost never put a door in the middle except the main door. And it just makes sense because when it's in the middle, it really disrupts the flow. So, uh, this just happens to be taking up a little less room. Now, this isn't a bad idea. It is a good idea to have a decent sized space in front of your door that is open with as minimal furniture as possible because this is called an internal bright hall. And this allows the chi to kind of like collect here whenever you open up the door and then it will travel to the rest of the house. So, uh, but you have to have a, a space for it to collect. If it's tight, it, it really has a hard time moving into the rest of the house. So here's another possibility of how you could lay this out. And um, if you had, let's say you had poker night with your buddies um, once a week, you probably would want to have a table permanently set up, or maybe you have a game night once a week with your family. 
So this could be a possibility. Now this becomes the entire space. And I'm assuming that the door would be over here. Uh, so this is, again is a possibility. Uh, so it depends on how you lay out your furniture exactly where the boundary of your living room is. And that's really, really true for your, your living room. It is also true for your dining room. If you only had a, um, a four table thing, you would obviously say the dining room would be here if the table was more like this size. So you have to adjust it for what you have. So in this case, we know that the living room is in the Northeast because it's almost completely in the Northeast. The dining room is in the East. In fact, it's not even doesn't fill all of the East. The kitchen is in the Southeast, not because of the area, although it true is true that the Southeast is slightly larger. It's because of the location of the range. So the kitchen is Southeast. So here's another example. This is the same house, but now it faces southeast. And so now you would say, okay, let's focus on the living room because this is dividing the room into two. I don't know how well you can read this, but this says 165, this says 135, and that's for arrangement number one where we had the sofa here and uh, a TV here. And uh, which one of these two is, is bigger? It is the east. So this, with the arrangement number one, this living room would be in the east. Arrangement number two is this larger area. So if we compare the two areas, this is still 165, but now this is 225. So then as arrangement number two, this would be a southeast living room. So this is why it's important to know exactly where your furniture is located in your floor plan. So again, it's going to be either an east or southeast room depending on your layout. Now, the living room is not an important room unless you happen to use it as a home office also. And when that happens, then wherever the chair is located, it overrides the determination. So even if you had arrangement number, uh, number two and you have a desk over here uh, and a chair, it becomes an east living room, especially when you're working. But the rest of the time, whether it's a southeast or an east, it doesn't really, honestly, doesn't really matter because this is not an important room, except for as a home office, if you actually use it as a home office. If you, do, if you have another room that you use as a home office and occasionally you work there, that usually doesn't count. We're talking about this is your primary place to work. So now let's go to the idea. Okay, let's say we have arrangement number two. We know our living room is a southeast room, but we want to activate this East three. And that's because we, let's say one, one year, and this will happen, the date selection subsector will be in East three. Um, but this is not an East room, doesn't matter. You still would be putting the activation in the East three subsector. And in general, you aim for the middle because that just makes it easier not to misplace it. You could also work here temporarily. You could put a small table and a desk here or a chair here to work. That would really activate this place. And assuming that this place doesn't have an annual affliction, uh, then it would be a good thing to do. And you could even have music playing as long as there isn't a uh, there isn't an annual affliction in the, well, it would be Southeast one, Southeast two, East two, and East three. As long as there's no annual afflictions there, you're okay to use that. You're okay to put music there if you want to. And um, if you do work here, you temporarily will change the living rooms um, sector identification to East. 
But if you just place an elemental activation there, you do not change the rooms, the whole rooms identification because you're not there doing work. Uh, you just have an element there that activates that particular subsector. I, I hope that's clear. And again, we are assuming there's no annual affliction in East 3. And if you want to have music, you can't have it in any of the subsectors where your room outline is defined. Now, if your plans have a standard scale, you can use a, a scale ruler to measure distances. But uh, if you have a, a let's say, a, a PDF or some sort of file like that, and you want to print it out, you have to print it out on this, on, and it has a scale thing listed. It is only to scale when it's printed out on the right size piece of paper. Uh, it could that can screw it up if you print it on a different size. Most architectural drawings are on huge pieces of paper that uh, in the United States is called architectural D and it is like 36 by 24 inches. It's very large. So if you print it out on a 11 and a half or 11 by eight and a half, everything is so tiny. And of course it's very hard to read. That's why they're printed out so big is so you can actually read all the notes. But that is something that you are going to have to figure out or have someone help you. And it's a teenager in uh, probably can help you with this, especially if they're any good at math. They will understand how to do this. So hopefully you have somebody in your life that you can contact if you don't understand how to do this yourself. So I wanted to point out um, this is that same one we just looked at with it's in the southeast, facing southeast. You would say the, the door is divided into two. What does that mean? Well, your door definition, which sector it will be in, is the door opening, you divide it in half. This is the center line. That's what CL means. That will determine where the door is located. And so in this case, it is in uh, southeast two. So this is a Southeast two door, even though it shares two sectors. So doors can only have one sector, rooms can only have one sector. And that's, and, and you define the room whichever way you want to define the room. Now here, this is the kitchen. Now you see the range actually spans two. So how do we know which is right? Well, it's the center of the front of the range that determines the sector. Now, if this line were to go right through the center of the front, uh, we would not have a defined sector for the range. So hopefully that won't happen. Um, it, it would be pretty negative if that happens. So in this case, the kitchen is in the south. So I'm going to ask you some questions. You can, we've went through all this. Hopefully you can answer them. What sector is the kitchen? You should be able to answer this quite quickly, but you can pause this if you need to. It's in the east. Where is the dining room? Well, that's pretty easy. It's in the northeast. So we can ask that also here, what sector is the living room? And you can look at arrangement number one and arrangement number two. Number two is pretty easy, but think about number one. They both happen to be in the north because even here with this, this obviously is bigger. This is the bigger area. And of course, this assumes you don't have an office here. You're not using it for an office, that is. So you could, if you have the ability, put a desk and uh, chair here for working. It's a little hard in a living room because everybody hangs out there, but it's possible. So in theory, you could decide what your room, what you want your room to do be by placing a desk uh, and a chair in whichever sector has the better properties if you really wanted to do that. But hopefully you don't have to use this as your, your home office unless you live alone and then that's fine. 
Now, ranges are best placed in non-animal subsectors because they only can get affected by the five yellow in terms of the annual afflictions. So that's the best place for them to be. And everyone I've showed you, they just happen to fall into a non-animal subsector. Um, I, and, and, you know, there are, there are quite a few non-animal subsectors, so it's not that hard. So again, open areas, this is a summary, they need to be divided by usage. Rooms that are bisected by two of sectors, uh, the following apply. When you activate a subsector or sector uh, with activity or an element, wherever that thing is placed, the activity or the element occurs, only that subsector will be activated. And this is regardless of the overall identity of the room. Um, because you're activating a subsector, usually. Now, activating with activity or an element should be avoided when there are annual afflictions or the day clashes with the residences, all everybody's batza. Again, year for everybody, month for the working adults, and the day if it concerns uh, the spouse or a significant other, and the hour if it concerns investments, children, or ideas. So this is standard. You've probably heard this before. Now, when an important room is bisected by two different subsectors, or two different sectors, I should say, not subsectors, uh, you can choose the better the sector by the placement of your desk, the chair of your desk, that bed's headboard, or possibly the range. The range would be the expensive one, because that would probably mean you redesign the whole kitchen. But the, for home office and a bedroom, that's pretty easy. So that helps a lot in making sure you have good energy in these important rooms. So that's basically it. I'd like to thank you for uh, watching and please feel free either to leave a comment or email me here if you have any questions. Thank you again for watching.